Let's have a look at the resolution, re resolution on boundaries of my, of my mesh. Yeah? If we look at a normal profile of a fluid flow field, for example, we have here a wall and the water comes from this side. What happens if we look into the middle of the fluid flow? We have a velocity, maybe 5 meters per second. But if you go more and more to the wall, the velocity will be slower and slower. And we have nearly zero meters per second here at the, at the um, wall. And if you want to simulate such a problem, and we use a really coarse mesh with big cells here at the, at the walls, you will not get, get this the resolution of this high gradient here near the wall yeah? so we need a better resolution here in this region of high gradients and we do not need so much resolution at low gradients of the velocity so uh, here's a, have a look at different results at some simulations I made for you really easy simulations you have a big pipe here and a small pipe becomes a fluid from the inlet and goes to the outlet and we have one fine grid and here one a bit bit um, yeah, nearly the same mesh and you see uh, some details here at the wall the boundaries uh, are important you will get lower velocities here at this rigid yeah so we have a flow direction and we change our resolution of the mesh in the regions where you have big differences in velocities and big changes in our variables phi big gradients of the variables and we need a better resolution here so okay yeah, that's smoothness of the mesh. If you, if you have the resolution, you should avoid hard steps in the resolution. Yeah, here on the left side, you see a coarse mesh and directly the neighbor cells are really small. That's not good. We have to get a wide sudden changes in, in cells and we have more, can have more smooth uh, changes in the cell structure. Okay, so let's have a look at overall cell counts. Yeah, I, I, I teach you a lot about meshes and it always everything you, you have in, in science or in, in business, everything depends on money more or less. Yeah? And if you have a lot of money, you have fast computers, you, have, you can spend a lot of money and do your simulations can afford good computers then you can make big meshes a lot of cells and if you don't have so much money you have not not so big computer with a big fast uh, CPUs and, and big memory you can't make so good resolution in cells so what is the average resol resolution what is the cell number of a typical cell and let's say 100,000 cells, all, this, all the meshes I showed you before were only examples. Yeah? In real cases, we have about 10,000 cells here if we have relative small problems. And we have about 100,000 cells for intermediate size problems, for a bit more advanced problems. But we can have really fast cells in the range of millions yeah? if you have a realistic geometry of something of a, of a small nozzle of a burner of a cylinder you will probably have 10 million cells and it's you really get this number of cells really fast you come to 100 million cells that's more advanced yeah normally this is something i would say we can make simulations uh, up to 10 million cells is now for us, for our 
CPU cluster realistic, but not much more. Okay, this is something something for for aircraft or or rocket problem for really. If you have high computer power, you can have hundreds of millions of cells. Okay, then there's a point I want to mention. Um, we can have a solution adaptive meshes. That's more advanced. It's not so typically. Here we have, for example, a wing of an airplane, a knocker profile of an airplane. And we know there's always a region where we have high gradients, high pressure gradients. It can happen. I've seen this also in measurements. You can have at the nose high gradients or at the middle of the wing you can have sometimes high changes in velocity. And if you know you will have such a problem, you can do an adaptive meshing in this region here. Then you get more realistic results, for example, of a, of a step in a fluid flow field. But you can imagine that's difficult to do the mesh adaptive to your flow problem. Okay, so grid adaptive means, as I told you, you react on gradients in your solution. You have to know the numerical solution and then afterwards you can adapt your mesh and go more into detail where you have high gradients in the flow field. Yeah, or if you know you have somewhere a boundary cell, you can adapt your mesh in this boundary cell types. And there's also something I want to mention. We have to have a closer look later on this value, the so Y plus value. Yeah, Y plus value gives you um, an idea of you have the right resolution of cells near a wall. Okay, here's also another adaptive mesh. Yeah? It's, uh, yeah, it's not a wing now. Your problem now is a bullet of a gun. And if you have these bullet problems, bullets are really fast geometries, really fast problems. You will have supersonic flight, you will have um, a high gradient in the in the pressure and in the density field around the bullet, you will have a wave, a shock wave, and to get realistic results of this shock wave boundary, you have to adapt your mesh here before the nose of the bullet, the tip of the bullet. But this is, you can imagine, this is more advanced, and we will not do such an example here in this lecture. Yeah, that's also an adaptive um, structure. Here we have a, a hexaedral structure near a boundary. And if we go more to the far field of the simulation, we have an unstructured mesh. And if we have really far, far field of the geometry, we again get a structured mesh. We get faster simulation times here. Okay. Then I want to teach you a bit, I just want to teach you, we will not do such simulations, but I want to tell you something about multi-critting multi technologies. Multi-critting is something I have not heard a lot about this in the last years, but I think every code does it automatically today, or many codes do it automatically, you don't even mention it. But in former days, you had to do, there was a trick, like a, like a trick, like a, a, to fasten your simulation. You made a coarse mesh of the domain, you made a finer mesh, and then you made a much finer mesh. And first you solve the solution on the coarse mesh, you interpolate it on a more medium mesh, and made then a solution here, and then you interpolate it on the fine mesh. This was to fasten up your simulation. Yeah, to get a prediction and then a detailed result later. Okay, that's our strategy. We can also make coarse mesh, finer mesh, coarse mesh, even finer mesh, coarse mesh, and even finer meshes. You can have several levels of grid details to, f 
fast enough. But more or less this technique is done in the background of the code. Today you will in many cases not mention this technique, this multi-critting technique. And I would say the computers are really fast today. Maybe you even do not need multi-critting so often. At least if you just use your code, you will not mention it. It will be done in the background of the of the CFD code. Okay, here's also another example I used, I made for you. It's a cone that is falling down in a, in a water um, pipe. Yeah? And here we have an example for moving meshes. I made this with another CFX for you. And I also used the example from OpenFoam. And what we do now, we have a moving geometry. This is an iron cone, it's falling down in the water, glass, and you see the mesh. If you move down the geometry, the mesh will be here pushed together. Yeah. So, and now if you look at the details of the meshes, you will bend the mesh somehow, in some way. Yes, some also some time steps of the results. You see high gradients of water have to flow from here to here, and you have will have regions of high velocities here and move down the cone. And I, I did this example of a moving cone to compare two different safety codes. That's also something if you do meshing, uh, you can use this meshes. With different codes, especially for example, if you use the tool ISOM, you can mesh, do the mesh for fluent, you can do the mesh for CFX, or you can do the same, you can use the same mesh in open form. Yeah? And I made this example to compare both cases against each other, to compare the results. Okay, that's another a nice simulation here where I compared geometries of ball valves. Yeah, what you see here, we have a, a ball valve geometry here, a ball valve geometry here, and it's also a bit cavitating yeah, at the low the pressure. And maybe you can see here, the fluid flows come from down and the ball valve opens and the fluid will be faster and faster here in the ball valve region. Okay, <coughs> and what we can do, what you see here, you see different alternative geometries of ball valves. For example, bigger ball, smaller ball, and here a flat valve. And that's something I want to mention. If you do a CFD simulation, these different meshes, it's always good to compare results against each other. If you only have one result, it tells you nearly nothing. But if you can compare it, you can compare a big ball valve with a small ball valve. You can say this is better, this is not so good. Or if you have such a flat seat, you can say this is even worse. Or for example, that's another example simulation I made with a moving mesh. Uh, uh, what, it, what is it? It's a tip of a diesel nozzle for a diesel injector. The diesel flows from the top here. It's a, it's a really detailed geometry. Huh? Normally this diameter it's only about 1.8 millimeters thick. It's a really small uh, needle pin and it's moved upwards and downwards and it if it moves up, the diesel fuel can flow outside the holes, and if it moves down, the diesel will not move anymore. And that's a good example for a moving mesh. If you do only one mesh for one needle lift, for one lift position of the valve, you will get nearly no result, no, no interesting result. You get one value. 
What is interesting is the movement, the dynamics of the needle is interesting. So you need a changing mesh geometry here in this region. And that's really tough to do such a geometry. And what is also tough in meshing is closing position. If you want, if it's really shut down, you have really a difficult structure of the mesh. Okay, here you can see it again. That's the result of a diesel nozzle. And what I made here, I, uh, I made simulation of mass flow velocities and pressure fields. And here you can see the pressure on the needle geometry. If it's red, it's high. And if it's smaller, it's blue. And what happens here? What can we see? What are these blue clouds? That are bubbles. Yeah, if the pressure goes down the separation below the separation pressure, we will get bubbles in the flow field, and they are caused by cavitation. And cavitational problems are really serious for all fluid flow problems. Here some pictures of cavitation erosion near the holes of such a nozzle, and they really they will damage the whole structure of the metal. The muscle. Okay, and let's come to the main sources of errors. What what uh, can go wrong with your when you start your simulation? At the beginning, I taught you good mesh quality is always really important. Main source of the error can be, the mesh can be too coarse. Yeah? If you have not a much not enough cells get wrong results but on the other side your mesh can also be too fine if you have if your mesh is so fine that you can never solve the whole problem then you also have no result yeah? and that's yeah that's also a problem you can have high skewness yeah? really sharp edged cells they will cause problems even crashes and numerical errors you can have large jumps yeah? if you have really small cells on one side and neighbor cells are really coarse then we can have bad numerical results we can have crashes and errors of the code we, if you have too large aspect ratios yeah? if, the cells, if a cell is really on one side really flat and long you will have a source of errors and of course interpolation problems or bad boundary conditions resolution of the boundary cells okay so i want to summarize the lectures design and construction of a grid is essential to cfd if you start with a bad quality mesh you will never succeed in all the other steps like solving or post-processing Okay, you have to make uh, meshes that fit your, to your conditions. Yeah? You have to, uh, to mention the geometry complexity. Yeah? If you have a complex geometry like a dinosaur, you need complex cells. Yeah? You have to, um, to take choice of your flow field. You have high gradients, turbulence swirls cloud swirls like hur hurricanes you need a good resolution at the region where your hur hurricane appears yeah and you have to make take mesh deformation into account if you have a for example geometry of a car cylinder you can't have static cells because the piston is moving you need also moving meshes Okay, so I want to thank you for your attention and I hope it helped a bit and I wish you much fun with your next exercise and yeah, see you.